Some see jobs. We see problem solvers. We see groundbreakers. We see risk takers. We see stories. Like a scientist turned CEO who went on to build a company producing medicines that saved the lives of millions. A young entrepreneur who started a business in a garage and now sells to dozens of countries around the world. A child who overcame dyslexia to lead the coding team at a global tech startup company. While every story is different, these stories have one thing in common, freedom. Freedom to dream, to create, to grow and pursue. We are a nation where competition and collaboration coexist. A nation whose rich tapestry of people and ideas create innovation and opportunity. At the US Chamber of Commerce, we advocate, inform, connect, and fight for America through business growth, building strong relationships that push us forward with communities across the country and governments around the globe so that the story of America continues to inspire the world. Hello, and welcome to the competition series, where we dive deeper into some of the themes we began to unpack during the 2022 State of American Business event. Throughout this series, we're exploring how competition propels our country and world toward a brighter future of growth, solutions, and opportunity. If you've missed or want to rewatch any of this programming, you can find it on uschamber.com. Today's focus is on the competition for ideas. Competition of ideas fosters the civil discourse and constructive exchange of views that lead to common ground and real solutions. We know that democracy and free enterprise go hand in hand. They're both spurred by the freedom that allows people and businesses to rise on the merits of their hard work and ideas. We also know that political polarization has a negative effect on business and our economy. Whether it's the inability of lawmakers to turn good ideas into good policy that moves our country forward, or the culture wars that put increasing pressure on employers and job creators who drive innovation, opportunity, and prosperity in this country. All of us, lawmakers, business leaders, media, and citizens across the country need to get on the same side in this competition for our future. Our first conversation today will focus on the state of polarization in our society and its impact on American business. Next, we'll examine how businesses can advance civil discourse when other institutions fall short. Then we'll conclude with a conversation on what concrete steps the business community can take to advance productive dialogue in our society. We hope today's discussions will provoke thought, provide insights, and equip you to elevate civil discourse in your own organizations and communities to lift our entire nation. Enjoy the program. Thank you, Suzanne. Hello, everyone. I'm Neil Bradley, Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Polarization and political instability are fueling intense challenges for American businesses. Today's discussion will focus on how businesses can best navigate these challenges and risks. Here to help us break it down is William Galston, Senior Fellow, Governance Studies Programs at the Brookings Institution. Many of you may know Bill from his weekly columns in the Wall Street Journal, an always thoughtful way to think about the issues of the day. Welcome, Bill. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. So in your piece, one of the things that you start off talking about is the juxtaposition between support for democracy among the American people uh, in principle and support in practice. I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about what that means and what you see as the risk to the free enterprise system from polarizations or breakdowns in democracy. 
sure, Neil. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, if you look at public opinion, which is one of the things I do for a living, uh, you see something that's not quite a paradox, but is certainly a tension. That is, on the one hand, if you ask standard questions, uh, do you think democracy is the best form of government? Would you like to live under a different form of government, et cetera? Uh, support for democracy is deep and broad across the lines that divide us, including partisanship, ideology, et, et cetera. So officially, Americans are as supportive of democracy as they ever have been. Uh, they continue to brace, embrace our founding creed. When you ask them, how is our democracy doing? You get a very different set of answers. Uh, and almost nobody thinks that our democracy is functioning well. And most people think that it's not functioning as well as it did a generation or two generations ago. Uh, they point to intense partisan polarization, but also to the fact that this, the heartbeat of our democracy, namely the Congress of the United States, appears to be gridlocked and incapable of conducting the people's business. Add to that intense disagreements about the legitimacy of the 2020 election uh, and thought in some quarters uh, that it may be legitimate to resist uh, illegitimate elections and their outcomes by force. And you have a formula for potential social disruption or even violence. I don't think I have to spend a long time explaining why democratic instability and intense partisan polarization are bad for the private sector. Uh, it makes for policy gridlock, followed by swings of public policy. Uh, there's a temptation to resort to populist economics in order to curry favor. Uh, even though populist economics uh, turns into a disaster for the private sector uh, once its initial uh, impact has been dissipated. So the private sector, I conclude, has an intense interest or should in the stability and functionality of democratic political systems. That's been true in the United States, but the best academic research shows that it's true around the world. Democracy and a well-functioning private sector go together. You know, it's you're reminding me of a um, an article I read in The Economist a decade ago, maybe, that compared uh, the rule of law in countries with GDP. And there was a perfect almost correlation between strong rule of law and better economic growth. And when the rule of law would break down, you would begin to see that that breakdown in, in economic growth. And we've been at the chamber talking about for four or five years, this problem of gridlock and these swings uh, from, from uh, one kind of new administration to the other uh, in, in terms of policy. But I want to dig into something else you talk about um, in the in your paper that struck me as really important as a differentiation. And um, one of the things that you cite is that the institutional or the hard guardrails of democracy have largely held, even under you know some sustained pressure. But that the so-called soft guard guardrails, the norms of how elected officials and Congress should operate. Uh, seem to be failing. What do you mean by those soft guardrails? And can you can you give us examples of what that looks like? Well, by norms, political scientists tend to mean uh, self-restraint by leaders and political parties. So technically speaking, the institution and its rules and procedures will allow you to do something. Then the question is, what happens if you push those powers to the hilt? Not breaking rules and procedures, 
but breaking a tacit understanding that neither side will go too far. Uh, at that point, you tend to get into a kind of a Hatfield-McCoy situation where each side can point to the alleged bad behavior of the other side as justification for taking the next step. And an excellent illustration of that cycle uh, would be the gradual evisceration of the filibuster uh, because of frustration on both sides of the aisle that the other party was being intransigent. Uh, nobody is breaking any rules exactly, but the informal grease that allowed the machinery of the Senate to function has been withdrawn. And as a result, you know, the gears are wearing, they move uh, less quickly. Uh, and with more erosion of the actual underlying machinery. Uh, and I could give a lot of other examples, but uh, that it seems to me is the most uh, conspicuous and also timely one, given what we're now undergoing. We have business uh, leaders from across the country tuning in today, um, and increasingly they're dealing with not just the direct issues that you've been talking about, Bill, but a lot of the related social issues of problems in our country and the breakdown of uh, the ability of our elected officials maybe to address and, and solve those problems. Um, before getting uh, to any recommendations that you might have for, for the business leaders assembled, I want to go back to a point you made in, in the piece that we discussed a minute ago, which is that there are lots of competing faction, uh, factors here for business leaders. They're under a lot of pressure mm -hmm. uh, to speak out and act from various stakeholders. But sometimes those pressures uh, are pointing in opposite directions. And sometimes businesses can act in a way that actually reinforces the polarization or reinforces the breakdown of, of norms. How is it that business leaders should think about navigating that? And how important is it that we be cognizant of not doing things that actually reinforce the polarization that we're seeing in our political system? Boy, I sure don't envy the situation that business leaders now find themselves in very much against their, their own will. Uh, and if I were at the helm of a major corporation being pressured to take stands on important social issues, uh, I wouldn't know which way to turn, to be frank. Uh, obviously, you don't want to venture into troubled waters if you can possibly avoid it, but sometimes you can't avoid it. And I have no general advice for you except to follow the private sector version of the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Uh, and if you think that taking a stand on a contested public policy issue is simply going to make matters worse, then to the extent that you can, resist taking that step. On the other hand, and this is a point that my co-author and I make in our paper over and over again, in times past, uh, businesses have taken stands on important issues at home and abroad. I, I think it will suffice to refer to the very important role that the U.S. private sector played in putting pressure on the apartheid regime in South Africa. Uh, and there are lots of other examples in our paper. So abstaining from these issues, refraining from getting involved in them is not always the right thing to do, but sometimes it is. Uh, there is something very important that I think businesses can do right now. Uh, I suspect everyone participating in this call remembers the events of January 6th, 2021, when there was an armed assault on the Capitol building with the intention of disrupting the procedure of ratifying the, uh, the electoral vote count from the states. Some of that disruption was made possible by the ambiguities and contradictions of a very old law by the name of the, Ele the Electoral Count Act, which was adopted in 1887 in response to 
one of the two most contested elections in American history, namely the election of 1876. The fact that it took 11 years after that disruptive election to uh, pass that legislation tells you that congressional inefficiency is not simply of this moment. Uh, at any rate, there is a growing bipartisan movement to reform and revise the Electoral Count Act to make sure that there will be no legal ambiguity or precedent or support uh, for the sort of pressure that was applied to Vice President Mike Pence on January 6th of 2021 to uh, invalidate the electoral uh, the electoral slates of different contested states. Uh, and that is an example of a, of a role that the business community could play. The link between this issue and your interests may not seem immediate, but the election of 2024 is three years away, and it is perfectly possible uh, that we will see a repeat of what happened on January 20, uh, January 6, 2021, unless there is a clarification of the legal system. Uh, and I would recommend that businesses around the country take a good hard look at the swelling bipartisan support for reforming the Electoral Count Act and, and consider adding your voices to that chorus. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today, Bill. Oh, it's been a pleasure appearing with you, Neil. Till next time. Till next time. We've taken a look at the polarized landscape and what it means to protect democratic norms. Now I'd like to turn to the state of the institutions and dive deeper into the political and economic uncertainty caused by polarization and how it impacts the American business community. Joining me for this discussion is Dr. Yuval Levin, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Yuval, thanks for joining us today. Great to be with you, Neil. Okay, so I want to dive right into your most recent book, a Time to Build, which really gets at the key questions that we've been discussing today. And it's all about institutions. But one of the things that you start the book off is um, juxtaposing institutions and organizations. And I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about what you mean when you talk about institutions and when you talk about organizations and why uh, you decided to write a whole book about institutions and how they might be relevant uh, to our, our discussion today. Yeah, you know, the term like institution is so broad, so capacious that it can mean almost anything. And so it is important to explain exactly in what sense it relates to the kinds of problems we're facing in our society. Broadly speaking, what I mean by institutions are the durable forms of our common life, the shapes, the structures of what we do together. Institutions are how we act in common toward shared goals. So some of them are organizations and have something like a corporate form, a university or a hospital or a school or a business uh, are all institutions. They're legally formalized. But some institutions are, are durable forms of a different kind. Maybe they're shaped by laws or by norms still, but they're without that corporate structure. The family is the, the first and foremost institution of any society. You could speak about the institution of marriage or a particular tradition or a profession as an institution, the rule of law as an institution. One thing that's crucial about them is that they are durable. They keep their general shape over time, and so they can shape the realm of life that they operate in. They change gradually, generally speaking. A flash mob is not an institution, even though it's a bunch of people working together. But most important, what's distinct about an institution, I would say, is that it's a form in the deepest sense, that it gives a shape to common action. And for that reason, it gives different people roles in relation to one another so that they can all pursue a good together. Um, and so a social form, an institution, is not just a bunch of people. It's a bunch of people who are ordered together to achieve a purpose, to advance an ideal. 
And that means that an institution by its nature is also formative, that as it allows people to work together, it also shapes them. It shapes their relationship to one another, and ultimately it shapes their character, it shapes their mode of behavior, it shapes their soul. And among the things that institutions do for us is that they form us to be good at working together with other people. And the weakening of institutions means that we become less well-formed to do that kind of work. So in a society with weaker or weakening institutions, people become less capable of common action. We don't always know kind of where to go to achieve the goals we have, to work together with other people. And in a lot of ways, that's the kind of problem we're facing now in America. Is it fair to say that, you know, in a polarized environment, and America has been polarized before, it's, this is not a new situation. It really is the institutions that help people bridge that polarization to, you know, achieve some ultimate goal or just to, frankly, be able to get along together in society. Is that how we should think of the role of institutions? Exactly. Institutions help us to engage in common work. And so they say, look, put that difference aside for now. There's this work to be done. Or they say, you've got these differences, these divisions. Here is a way to address them. Here's a way to deal with them. To, to, to get at problems through cooperation, through compromise, through accommodation, the shape and structure of the institution. Think about the institutions of our politics in relation to this, for example, so that the, the Congress, for example, is built precisely to allow us to deal with difference. It's a way to take deep differences and create a structure for reaching accommodations. A lot of our institutions end up working that way. And again, when they're weaker, what happens is that those differences just pour out into the open and people don't have a place to go to address them. And so they go wherever they can find a functioning institution. A lot of times you find people bringing their politics to school or to work and expecting their, 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 their university, their job, their employer to play a role in uh, engaging in political debate. And the reason for that is that a lot of the institutions we have that are intended to play that role have become weaker. So in a polarized society, we look for places where we can direct our energies. And a lot of times now, that means that we're finding ourselves engaging in work that's out of place, that's out of context, because our core institutions of engagement, like Congress, like the university, like, uh, like journalism, where we're supposed to engage with differences, to encounter one another, are not working well. And that makes the rest of our social life much more combative and confrontational than it otherwise would need to be. I think that probably resonates with a lot of people in our audience today, you know, who are kind of waking up to this realization that people always used to have concerns, but they used to take their concerns to maybe different institutions or different societal groups. And now they're bringing their non-work concerns to work because work happens to be the place where they're gathered and they, they spend the most time. That's obviously a, a challenge for businesses, which aren't, at least as institutions, set up to fulfill maybe those other roles. Um, how should we think about the role of businesses in that environment, both in responding to filling that need that people have in society, but also maybe in rebuilding those other institutions right. exactly. that might be better ways to for people to express their needs? Yeah, I think both of those are very important. So there's no question that a lot of the energies that normally would flow through our civic institutions and our political institutions now find themselves expressed in the business world, because that's a place where you still find functioning institutions, where you're still, as you say, engaged with other people. And people come into the workplace to a much greater degree than would have been the case a generation or two ago, expecting to find avenues for political expression, expecting to have their own political views reaffirmed, whatever those might be. And obviously, those that, that creates an enormous challenge in the business world. Um, one thing to recognize is that it is important to constrain and contain the degree to which our, 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 our commercial institutions become politicized. They can't just become another venue for partisan sniping and partisan warfare. Like, all of our institutions are quickly becoming. It is important that there be a refuge from that. And also, of course, you want to reach a broad base of customers. And so you can't just politicize your uh, business and expect that people who don't agree with you are going to be comfortable being there. It is important to draw lines and draw distinctions and say there's room 
for politics, but there's also room for just providing a service, uh, meeting a need. And we've got to do that in a way that doesn't divide people by their political views. At the same time, I think it's very important for the business world to be engaged in strengthening those other institutions. Some of those, as I say, are civic institutions, places where at the local level, people can gather together to address common problems and to address uh, public challenges. And the business world can be very helpful, both in encouraging workers to be part of that civic world and in providing resources and providing assistance to civic institutions so that those problems can be addressed that way. I think it's also important to be engaged in ways of strengthening our core political institutions um, and being part of the solution, allowing for political problems to be addressed through the mechanisms that exist in our society for, for dealing with them. I would say it's very important to see our constitutional system basically exists to allow a divided society to address its problems. That's actually what it's for. That's what it was created for, what it's intended for. There's a variety of institutions within that system that exist to let us deal with problems without resorting to violence and without the breakdown of social order. And so strengthening those institutions, Congress, federalism, the state legislatures, uh, bo both local and state politics, and in a lot of ways, our national institutions, um, is, I think, a proper role for the business world because, again, it, it's necessary to create the preconditions, the environment for the kind of commercial activity that's, that American business wants to engage in to be possible and to be uh, doable in, in a safe and constructive way. You know, in our, in our last session, Bill Galston talked about uh, hard guardrails, kind of the rules and strictures of our government institutions and soft guardrails, kind of norms. And he was a little bit focused on norms failing, uh, strict structures holding, but norms yeah. and soft guardrails falling apart. Uh, do you agree with the, the, the diminution of the soft guardrails? And maybe are there things that the business community in particular can do around restoring kind of normative behavior in the soft guardrails of, of our institutions. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to think about the challenges we face. Um, you know, it, it's not the case that our democracy is on the brink of destruction. The core institutions, um, the, the, the structure of our politics and the courts and the, the, the legal boundaries around what can happen are holding okay, they're holding pretty well. But as you say, the, the norms, the culture of our politics has broken down in some dramatic ways. I think that's been encouraged by a variety of developments, by social media, by the, the polarization of our partisan differences. Um, and I would say that it's important for businesses to think in terms of building a culture of community, of helping people be in the habit of engaging with people they don't agree with, of hearing views they don't agree with. Part of what that means is keeping politics out of the workplace, is saying this is actually a space where that's not what we do. Um, it, we've lost the sense in American life in this century that different institutions do different things. You know, a, a business and a university and a newspaper and a hospital are actually different. They're not all just places to stand and yell about politics. They each have a purpose to serve and a role to play. And I think it's important for business leaders to insist that the workplace is not just another place to argue about politics. It's not just social media and the real world. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to encourage engagement, to encourage voting, to encourage political participation and, and, and civic participation, again, in a, as a way of building up those norms of suggesting that the expectations we have of one another have got to be higher so that we can sustain the kind of free society we have, which does demand a lot of us. It, it, it demands a certain kind of political culture that we have to do a better job of building and sustaining. Yuval, um, we're going to have to leave it there. You've given us a whole lot to think about today. Um, for those who are interested in exploring even more, I'd commend to you Yuval's book, A Time uh, to Build. Uh, but today we're going to talk about how businesses can help do exactly what Yuval talked about, uh, building up and shoring up those habits of democracy. So I'd like to welcome my colleague, Jenna Shrove, Director of Policy and Special Initiatives here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, to host our next session. Jenna, over to you.
so much, Neil. So we've heard about the risk increasing polarization poses on the private sector, and about changing perspectives of institutions. Now we pivot to a conversation around the tension companies feel when it comes to engaging on some of these large societal issues and how they can effectively navigate this reality. Joining us today are David Eisner, President and CEO of Convergent Center for Policy Resolution, and Mira Macaluso, the co-founder and managing principal at Corporate Civic Consultants. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. It's great to be here, Jenna. Thanks for having me. David, I'd like to start with you. Where do we see a push for engagement on these issues originating and playing out with businesses? Um, Jenna, in the last um, several months, I've been in uh, many more conversations with businesses, and it seems like we're seeing um, polarization and uh, divisiveness become really untenable uh, in many cases at the C-suite level, um, in a lot of cases in, among employees, um, in some cases among uh, customer communities. And uh, finally, within the communities that the um, that businesses uh, operate, and um, while they all have the same challenges, the way of dealing with each of them is a little bit different. And um, what what we're really focused on is finding those opportunities to create genuine conversations that enable us to pull the heat down by uh, allowing people to better understand each other and to remind each other that they are in community with uh, together and that everybody is is human um, and that the sense of deep enmity does not need to persist inside companies. Awesome. We know there are tensions when it comes to engaging on some of these larger societal issues, including different views among stakeholders and questions of authenticity and consistency. Marin, what have you heard or learned from your conversations with CEOs? Thanks, thanks, Jenna, and um, great to be here. And David, what you said really resonates with me. I'd say um, the job of the modern business leader, which is complex really in the best of times, has only gotten more challenging. Um, and our research and our conversations tell us that companies really face fundamental questions of you know, whether, when, and how to engage. Questions like, where do we stand on the vaccine main, mandate? And how do we communicate about that? You know, how do I meet employee expectations in response to the next racially divisive moment? The 2022 midterms are around the corner. What's my role as a business leader to encourage voting? So, um, you know, on the one hand, companies are increasingly facing pressures to get involved. The vast majority of their employees, um, their, their customers, often their investors, want them to take a stand. You know, on the other hand, though, there are potential minefields, right? You know, we've heard about um, CEOs being wel welcomed into policy debates, but not so much into politics. Um, we've also seen data that suggests, you know, a, a majority of corporate executives think their communication on social issues is effective while less than half of the public actually agrees with them. So often what companies say isn't coming across as authentic or ringing true. And then of course, you know, media and social media accelerate rapid reveals of consistencies um, and miscues. I would say the good news is that business leaders and particularly, you know, my CEO has a lot of trust and, and confidence and, um, I think the opportunity now and the inflection point we're at is that it's becoming less of a choice for business leaders to actually sort of lean in to, to civic engagement. Um, and so the question then becomes, how do I do that effectively? Certainly, and there are a lot of stakeholders, not just CEOs in this. And David, your work at Convergence centers around bringing those multiple stakeholders to the table and building consensus around important policy issues. Right. In your dialogues, you always make sure to include people and institutions with opposing views with the goal of bridging divides and finding consensus. How important is that for businesses to think about when engaging on these issues? It, it's it's really, really important. The the and, and and let's go in two directions. First, let's talk about the work of in of um coming up with smart solutions 
to key issues, especially national issues. Being part of a discussion as uh, folks are inside convergence dialogues means that from that the differences, whether they're political, ideological, sectoral, or, or others having to do with life experience, um, that overcoming those differences is the only way to end up with solutions that are able to serve all interests. Now, obviously not every problem is best solved by consensus. There are certain things where you say, well, let's just push something through since we know we have a majority. Um, and yet there are a lot more opportunities for doing things by consensus than, um, than I think most people realize. Really quickly at Convergence, we just finished a dialogue on guns where we were able to bring together people uh, from the uh, gun ownership community, gun manufacturers, together with people in the anti-violence um, uh, space, people that uh, might sometimes be uh, thought of as about gun control. And um, we were able over a course of months for them to be able to find ways to relate to each other that none of them thought they could accomplish at the start of the dialogue. We've had similar successes around the economy, around healthcare, um, around uh, justice, and uh, we continue to be doing uh, many of these dialogues. This, this, uh, I'll go really quickly here, Jenna, but the second um, uh, really important area that it's important is as um, companies are trying to quell internal uh, conflict, um, being really focused on what it means for the different interests to come together, learn about each other, and uh, begin to understand each other, and then find ways to relate to each other to solve common challenges. That's uh, cr critical work. Um, it's actually not impossible, um, and it's not even that difficult, but it does require some amount of specialization to be able to bring that kind of dialogue together. Definitely agree with you. And it sounds like the process um, and having that in place is very important to coming to some sort of solution. Marin, how important is for is it for companies to be developing a civic engagement strategy or a process of assessing these types of risks? Yeah, I, I think this, this sense of um, it, it, it's doable, but it, it's not necessarily easy. It is, is really important um, as David spoke to. Um, you know, at the, the firm I co-founded, Corporate Civic Consultants, we know it's becoming an imperative for companies to develop civic engagement strategies. But really, often this is a new muscle or a new capability for, for companies, um, and they need to build it, right? And there, there are some there's some obstacles. There's a lot of complexity around the kinds of issues, for instance, David um, spoke about and the questions I posed earlier. You know, where do you go for reliable, nuanced information to answer those questions? Um, it's often very siloed within companies of different sizes. You know, different business units um, and initiatives might hold a piece of the puzzle, HR, marketing and communications, ESG efforts, et cetera, um, which makes accountability hard, right? Like who's responsible and who owns this? Um, and I would also say that in this area, metrics aren't really well developed. You know, how do we assess the risks and determine what success looks like? So while I'd say there's no easy answer or one size fits all strategy for companies, um, we've developed an expertise in a process for helping companies to build these, these capabilities, right? And, and like most major new initiatives, CEO and board leadership is actually absolutely critical. Um, what we do is, is, is customized companies' individual needs as well. And, and depending on um, corporate purpose um, and company values and ESG initiatives, there may be different answers within companies um, around, you know, what are our bright lines, right? Like what issues do we want to, to, to lean into and lead on? Where might we want to be part of a coalition? Um, or where might we um, uh, hold back? So I think it's important to, to anchor the, this work in, um, you know, fact-based, risk assessment of, first of all, where you stand, 
um, what your your team and your workforce thinks. Um, uh, as, as David mentioned as well, um, how do you kind of first of all look at and, and manage brand and reputation risks because they're often big risks between uh, lying between what a company um, what companies say and what they do, right? Like. Do we invest in politicians who favor a particular business goal but, but don't align with our corporate values? And are we aware of that? Are we ducking societal issues entirely in a desire to stay above the fray? But you know, our workforce and customers have other ideas. So getting a good handle on that, I think, is really important. Um, focusing on best practices um, and generating an idea is to close those risk gaps. Um, and then developing new civic programming. You know, I know Jenna, you'll talk more about that in the next segment, but there, there's a wide range of civic programming that companies can adopt um, that help them address a lot of these, these issues. And we think about it in three stages. You know, how do we assess? How do we develop new um, capabilities? Um, and how do we then effectively deploy, uh, deploy these, communicate them about, about them, and then you know, measure and refine what we're doing? So at the end of the day, it's about creating this new muscle and the resilience of a company to address civic challenges and take advantage of opportunities. I think that's exactly right. And I heard somebody say yesterday in a separate conversation, you measure what you treasure. <laughs> so I think the importance of metrics can be um, is, is very important. And you mentioned, too, that you're right. Our member companies, I think, would agree that choosing, figuring out what to choose to, to speak out on these types of issues really has to do with knowing, you know, your values, their values, and your stakeholders' values. Um, and I think, uh, I think that that is correct. So my last question, you mentioned resources, Marin. I'm going to toss out to both of you. What are some useful resources our audience can, can and should consider while navigating these issues? From the perspective of overcoming divides, which is important in and of itself. And then as Marin was really clear, it's also important to understand that as you take positions on, uh, on political or social issues, uh, those divides may also come up and so they need to be engaged. And the resources for that have exploded uh, in terms of what's available to you. There's uh, today more than uh, 450 organizations that uh, see their mission as helping American communities come together across differences. And so some of the best practices that uh, Marin was uh, alluding to, you can be engaging others to be supporting the company's um, adoption of those best practices. And the best place to go for that would be the um, Listen First uh, Coalition list, which um, which lists it out, um, as well as the Bridge Alliance, um, which also contains uh, a lot of resources. And of course, um, Convergence uh, is available, and we have a lot of opportunities for folks to participate in these dialogues if one of those issues is important to you. Marin? Um, yeah, I echo, I echo all of that um, uh, and, and agree. Um, I'll cite a couple of additional examples. Um, I'm personally a member of an advisor to an organization called the Leadership Now Project, which is an organization of business and thought leaders who are working to renew um, democracy and their analysis, resources, um, business toolkits are, are, are excellent. And, and so I recommend that. Um, I've worked with a number of organizations as a part of that coalition, and a great example of that is more in common. Um, they do ex extensive polling to understand the underlying values um, that inform uh, people's political opinions, and they develop messaging on challenging issues that really speaks to the broadest possible cross-section of people. And I think those are the kinds of resources that companies may not be aware of, but are, but are really valuable. Um, and we have a network of those. Um, one other um, area that I'll mention that I think is really interesting and becoming more developed here in the U.S. is, and I think there are, there, there are aspects of this and what Convergence is doing as well, is, you know, deliberative democracy, right? So um, it's a very innovative approach to reducing polarization and facilitates deep dives on issues. So 
Uh, there are a number of organizations doing that as, as well um, here in, in, in the U.S. You know, for example, the American in One Room uh, Project and, and Civic Genius, and, among others. So that's a, another, um, I think, growing area that, that may be of interest to companies as they seek to reduce polarization. Great. And to both of you, what is some other information CEOs should be considering as they're having these conversations? I'll go, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I'm thinking of two things. W one is when CEOs hear somebody say uh, the words, I just can't fathom what they're thinking. Uh, that means that polarization is playing in. There's two fundamental distortions that polarization creates. The first is motive misattribution, which makes uh, people feel like my group is acting out of love and the other group is acting out of hate. And then the second is moralization. Uh, my group is acting appropriately, legally, ethically. The other group is acting unethically in a way that's going to destroy the country or democracy and probably acting illegally. Tackling those distortions is the best way to deal um, with polarization. But because of those distortions, the other thing to keep in mind is that right now the national security community sees our divisiveness as the number one national security risk. And I've spoken to many people now that see our national divisiveness as our number one economic risk. So um, as CEOs are thinking about it, escalating the importance of this is also really important. Marin? Yeah, that, that's actually quite quite scary and concerning, David. And I, I, I agree with you that certainly the, the links between um, uh, the, the level of um, you know, distrust we're seeing and, and polarization and, and our um, economy, the healthy functioning of our economy are, are actually pretty well established. And that also underscores um, the functioning of our democracy. And as business leaders think about you know, how do I have a role in this and how might I weigh in? One piece of information to keep in mind is that, you know, in addition to my CEO holding a lot of trust with employees, um, you know, we saw in the, the Edelman um, report that came out last week, the, the communication that I get from my company, from, from my CEO, is the most trusted source of information as well, um, above other types of media. And so I think when we think about the opportunities that, that people have within their companies to have an impact here, um, it, it's more than you might, um, might think. And that that's, um, that's, might be, feel like a daunting responsibility, but I also feel like it's a big opportunity. Well, you've both shared some great information with our audience here today. Thank you both so much for sharing your perspectives and insights with us. Um, and we look forward with engaging with both of you on these issues further. Thank you. It's been uh, it's been terrific to be here, and and I know that um, the corporate community is going to be um, uh, jumping uh, quickly to uh, to figure some of these pieces out, especially around polarization. Certainly. Thanks so much for including me in this really important and incredibly timely conversation, Jenna. Thank you, Jenna. You know, for the last part of our program today, we're going to turn to civic engagement and the impact on our society of civics education. We know that a basis in civics understanding is essential to helping our country function. We've learned that there's a clear link between the skills you get in a civics ed class and the ones you need to be a part of the 21st century workforce. For more about how businesses can engage in the important work of helping develop a more robust knowledge of civics, I'd like to welcome Mike Carney, the Senior Vice President for Emerging Issues at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and coming to us from Maryland, Whitney Harmel, the Executive Director of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Whitney, Mike, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for Good morning, Neil. Okay, I want to start by basic definitions. 
what do we mean by civics and what do we mean by civics education? Mike, you want to start us off? Sure, Neil. And that's a good place to start because it's it's really the, the devil's in the details. So when we talk about civics education, what we mean is that ensuring people have the knowledge, the skills and the disposition to exercise their rights and fulfill their responsibilities in a democracy. That's a really broad category. And when you look at you know, how our country was founded, education was seen as a crucial part of preparing people for citizenship in a democracy. At some point, uh, we lost sight of that objective and under prioritized civics education in the classroom. For millions of Americans, the definition of civics is not clear. So, uh, Whitney, um, would you agree with that definition? Is there anything you might add to that? Yeah, well, first, Neil, thank you so much for inviting me um, to this conversation. Absolutely, I would agree with what Mike said, but I would also add a few things. And I recently read um, an incredible article about civics education, and it actually pinpointed three different areas in which we can focus in on. And the first one being civics knowledge and skills. So think of everything that you learn in the classroom growing up from history to understanding the processes of our government um, and our constitutional rights. And I think that's what most people probably tend to, to think of when they hear civics. But then we also have civic values. Think about things like free speech, but also my, my most personal favorite one is the um, engaging people with different perspectives. And I think we heard a little bit about that in the last conversation, the importance of um, creating diversity um, within your organization. And then also civic behaviors. So everything from volunteering to voting and all about how are you as an individual going to engage in your community? So I'm going to it's it's a little bit broader than the old schoolhouse rock video. And admittedly, um, when I think about civics, my mind goes to I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. And that's part of it. But uh, Whitney, as you point out, it has to be much broader than that, that the, the challenges that we're facing um, as communities mm -hmm. uh, requires us to have kind of these basic skills of how we live together and, and govern together. I want to understand a little bit about the business community's stake in it. And this is something, uh, Whitney and Mike, you're both working on on behalf of your representative foundations. Um, and that might strike some in our audience as um, maybe far afield from mission. Um, Mike, why is it that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation has decided to make investments in civics education? Um, why is that important to the business community? The answer is simple. Civics is important to the country, so it's important to the business community. Uh, a while back, I interviewed Tom Wilson, the CEO of Allstate and the chairman of our foundation. And one of the questions I asked him was why Allstate has made such efforts in civics. And I think his answer was, was perfect, which is one, we're long on America. And two, it's really, really important to our company. Uh, you know, we are not uh, separate or apart from society. We are of society. So what's happening in our kind of broader community has an impact on business. And what's happening in business has an impact on the broader community. So it's really important for us as a nation to ensure that we are strengthening uh, the civic ties, making sure that people have the knowledge they need to both fully participate in our democracy, but then also to know how to do things that are required among as a 21st century worker. You know, how do you uh, disagree without being disagreeable? How do you uh, operate within a system? These are all really sophisticated and complex things that, you know, if you look at civics textbooks from 100 years ago, you actually find some really uh, sophisticated and complex systems that, uh, that kids were being trained on that we don't train them on anymore. So companies have been stepping forward uh, in fits and starts over the past few years to fill gaps in our society's civic knowledge and civic skills, as, as Whitney so perfectly laid them out. You know, it, it ranges from uh, a General Mills, where they've, they've created something called Courageous Conversations, uh, or Cox has been doing things with its employees to educate them about what ballot measures are underway in the Southwest so that they can make informed decisions. All of these things are really important to the companies, but they're also really important to the community. And as we heard in the last panel, trust is just so uh, fragile right now 
employers are often seen as one of the few tr truly trusted voices in people's lives. And, you know, companies are stepping up to fill the void and also to use their trusted relationships to ensure that we strengthen our democracy in these important years ahead. You know, for a lot of our discussion today, we've been focused at the federal level and, you know, the breakdown in trust in federal institutions and the, uh, the confrontation that kind of goes on uh, when it comes to federal issues and, and politics. And we tend to often think of states maybe as safe havens away from that. But civics education is important for the employer community, even at the state level, uh, right, Whitney? Is that was that why um, the Maryland Chamber Foundation decided to, to get involved in civics? What are you seeing, and how do you compare and contrast that uh, to what we've talked about a lot today at the national level? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are three weeks into our 90-day session here in Maryland, and we, you know, we're engaging our members um, consistently on issues that are important to to business owners and and ultimately um, employees uh, of their organizations. And and I believe it was Marin who was talking in the in the previous um, conversation about about polarization. So the way that I look at um, engaging with our members and, and our businesses in, in terms of civics, it's really in two different ways. How does the business owner um, play a role in, in the political process? But also, how does that business owner um, engage with their employees in the, in the political process? And I think often um, employees want to engage. They don't know how to. And so that's a big part of what we do here in Maryland um, at our chamber is it's trying to also engage with the employees. And there's an, an incredible white paper from the Harvard Business Review on the Civic Trust website. I encourage um, any business owner to, to download it and to read it. And it talks about a few things, in, including um, the diversity of teams and the importance of that and what that means for an organization and, and collaboration and how morale goes up and, um, and innovation increases. And that, it, that all plays into, you know, when you have, again, diversity on your team, there's different backgrounds and different perspectives that plays into civics. And then from the business perspective, having the owners of the business talk to their employees about how certain legislation at the state level affects the, um, the business and then trickles down into the employee. I actually call it um, the pain chain. Mike and I were talking about it last week, and it's really important for everyone to know um, their role within this process. Okay, so we, we've laid the predicate. We know the why it's important. We know that there's a dearth. We've talked about that you know, for, the, for the last 45 minutes. I want to turn to the how. So, uh, Mike, let's start with you. The, the foundation, the U.S. Chamber Foundation, just announced a new civic trust program that's supposed to put the nuts and bolts to how we build civic education. What is the program? Uh, what is it aiming to do? It's a really ambitious program, Neil. So the civic trust has three priority areas. One is civics literacy. So we are working with chambers like the Maryland Chamber, the Kentucky Chamber, and four local chambers right now uh, in Thermopolis, Wyoming, in Mason City, Iowa, Brownsville, Texas, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, on pilots of something we're calling the National Civics Bee. And this is intended to uh, reward middle school students who master the knowledge and exhibit the skills that we need to see in citizens. And it's also intended to get local chambers more deeply engaged on civics at the local level. We hope to do more in that area and hope to ultimately be, grow be our civic literacy program beyond just school aged children. The second pillar is civics at work. This is a critical area. I mentioned before that we have under invested, under invested in civics for multiple generations. That means that we have to reach people who are not in school. You know, I was looking at data just this morning. Four in 10 Americans were unable to name all three branches of the government. That kind of uh, lack of knowledge is symptomatic of some big, big challenges because we are relying, we are a country that is self-governing and we, we need to make sure that folks have the information they need in order to make political decisions. I often say civics enables politics um, and we really do need to get the, the nuts and bolts straight. So one thing that we're looking at is how can we help companies encourage their workers to, to volunteer as poll workers? Another thing we're looking at is 
can employers do more to both encourage jury service and facilitate jury service? Because it's uh, democracy is about more than just voting. It's also about citizen engagement. It's about filling out the census. The third pillar of the Civic Trust Initiative is focused on elevating civics as a national priority. And this is a long-term commitment we're making to ensure that when we are thinking about you know, national security, we're looking at it from a civics perspective. When we're thinking about economics, we're thinking about it from a civics perspective. It is only through kind of an integrated and holistic approach to civics that we think we can make it the national priority that it must be for our continued prosperity. I, I love that it's not just about casting a ballot. You know, um, it yeah. is about the whole aperture of government. Um, you know, we rely on volunteers, uh, as you said, Mike, to man our elections. Um, we rely on people being called and being willing uh, to show up and do jury service, their civic duty uh, to enforce our laws and, and dispense justice. So there, there is a lot of work to be done here that goes well beyond maybe what people traditionally think of as civics and civic engagement. Um, Whitney, in the last minute or two we have here, I'd love to hear a little bit about what the Maryland Chamber is doing, how you're partnering, as Mike mentioned, with the U.S. Chamber Foundation, and what you think it's going to look like in Annapolis and throughout Maryland. Yeah, thank you, Neil. We are so excited to be a part of the Civic Speed, to be a part of this amazing pilot program. Uh, we feel very fortunate to have been asked. And I think it's going to be incredible for our middle school students to have an opportunity to participate in something like this. When you when you look at 11 to 14 year olds, those are really formative years. And um, the idea that students are starting to um, gain their own perspectives based upon experiences, we think we have we have an opportunity here to talk to them about um, what civics means to them, about community engagement. So it was a resounding yes. It fits right in with our pillar of education for the foundation. And we've, we've typically engaged with our teachers, but we will be engaging with the students this year and look forward to, to hopefully making this national in the next year. Well, Whitney, Mike, thank you. I am really looking forward to ESPN broadening their coverage and picking up the national civic speed uh, in a year or two. Um, I think that'll that'll be good for sports fans and Americans across the country. Uh, thank you both for what you're doing and what each of your foundations are doing. Uh, you were kind to take a few minutes and spend it with our audience today. Whitney, Mike, thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, everyone. I'm Carolyn Cauley, and I'm president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. We hope you've enjoyed these conversations on encouraging civil engagement in businesses and in government. As our CEO, Suzanne Clark, said in her State of American Business Address, the competition of ideas fosters the civil discourse and constructive exchange of views that lead to common ground and real solutions. And this we know. Competition is what will enable us to innovate our way through this pandemic. And it's competition that will help us use the challenges and the disruptions and the opportunities accelerated by the pandemic to shape a new economic era and define the better future we all want. We hope today's event has shown there are real opportunities for business leaders and policymakers to bring really diverse groups together to have open dialogues and build bridges and bridge the divide and promote civics education. Thank you so much to William Galston from Brookings and Yuval Levin from AEI for their insights on the intense challenges for businesses. And many thanks also to David Eisner and Mayrin Macaluso for their thoughts on how businesses can overcome those challenges and commit to constructive participation. I also want to thank the Chamber Foundation team, everyone on this team for their continued efforts to enhance civic knowledge across the United States. We believe that informed and active citizens are what we need to make a strong country, a strong economy, and a strong workforce. And our continued prosperity depends on all three of those things. 
If you're interested in learning more about our work, we encourage you to visit us at uschamberfoundation.org. And we hope you'll join us next week, same day, same time, for the fourth and final installment of our competition series. We'll be taking a look at the competition for talent and how do we expand opportunities for the workforce of tomorrow. It's Tuesday, February 8th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.